Hello everybody, just a quick disclaimer, the audio I recorded from my guest source came out a little too filtered than preferred, but I did what I could to tune it and make it at least a little bit more audible. I'm a little retarded when it comes to the audio kinks and technicalities, but rest assured, I'm learning as I go and I only hope to improve on this with future projects. So with all of that said, please enjoy this audio retrospective of Dracula. Hello, hello to all those tuning in. I uh, hope you're all feeling fine and dandy and healthy amidst today's current climate. I'm Jeremy Brown, and I am joined by a special guest named Ariella, a good friend and a big fan of the movie we'll be covering today, that being Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula, released in 1992 by Columbia Pictures. Vampires do exist. And this one we fight, this one we face, has the strength of 20 or more people, and you can testify for that, Mr. Harker. But he can also control the meaner things of life, the bat, the rodent, the wolf. He can appear as mist, as vapor, as fog, and vanish at will. Now all these things Dracula can do, but he is not free. He must rest in the sacred earth of his homeland to gain his evil power. It is here that we must find him and destroy him utterly. I guess it goes without saying, I, I'm going to date this podcast a little bit by addressing this, but we are living in a, a weird time right now with this uh, whole corona wuhan covid19 thing happening what, what do you make of this uh this pandemic that's just kind of hit us out of the blue oh it's great gives us lots of time to really focus on the things that are important like uh toilet paper hand sanitizer uh frozen meats being available at the grocery stores yeah people have made this whole thing all about like wiping your ass it's it's kind of uh <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of, like, bidet uh, ads on Facebook now. It's, uh, like, an overabundance of them. It's actually, it's kind of concerning. Um, I don't I don't like to have to just look at those all day long. It's, it's, it's horrible. It's toilet paper just on the black market now, you know. Just, it's being traded around like drugs. Yeah. Well, yeah, I trade some toilet paper for, like, uh, I think, like, an ounce of weed. I just saw that article. I think oh, someone okay. was trading toilet paper for, for weed, so. Wow. That's where the world's come to. Oh, well, I mean, we'll, we'll see if it passes in the next few months. Because <laughs> it, it just keeps extending and prolonging my, my, my job. <laughs> um, yeah, I, this is a, a weird time to be alive or dead. But we're, we're, I hope we're undead. at least undead, perhaps, too. Yeah, I mean, as long as we're all getting through it. And, you know, it's, I think this is a good segue into a film like Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is about a vampire that, you know, can't be in the sunlight for too long. And this is, a, you know, the time we're living right now, everybody's being a shut in. They're, they don't want to be out in the sun. They want to stay indoors and just act like real vampires. Yeah, he had to be invited into homes, too. But, you know, he wasn't great at the social distancing thing, I don't think. Captain's Log, the Dimitar, 27th June, 1897. We picked up 50 boxes of experimental earth bound for London, England. Set sail at noon into a storm that seemed to come out of nowhere, carrying us out to sea. So you uh, have expressed to me before that this is a film you are a huge fan of, correct? <laughs> That's true. I, I stand by that. Uh, would you say it's one of your favorite films? Yeah, I, I think so. I've watched it enough times and still enjoyed it that I think it certainly qualifies. How does it feel to have one of the most unpopular film opinions in the in the universe? Oh, it feels it feels great. I feel real special, Jeremy. Uh, you know, I definitely feel like like my own unique individual for this for sure. Good. I mean, I, honestly, so I'll I we both rewatched it again recently. Um, I will say there were a lot more things I thought were really appealing and cool about this take on Dracula that I might have either missed or felt were misguided in the past whereas now it, I was kind of a little bit more looking at this as a film on its own and not doing my best not to compare it so much to the book and I think that's what I did many years ago I was just so enamored with what I'd read and you know if it wasn't 
pitch perfect, I was just gonna probably not like it as much. But given like all the all of what went into making it, uh, I have a lot of a bigger appreciation for it for sure. It's definitely its own entity. I it's super weird. I I feel like the first time I watched it, um, my mom actually really liked it, so she got the DVD. And she tried to get me and my brothers and dad to watch it, and I was the only one who I think stuck around mm -hmm. for the full length of time. Um, and I think it helps that I've never actually like finished the book Dracula because, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a lot more out there and sexualized and like surreal than I think uh, from my recollection of the first part of the book. That was a little bit more. Uh, yeah, not not quite the same in tone, maybe. Well, it broke a lot of new ground and was certainly really ambitious at the time to, you know, go with this sort of take where it's not entirely book accurate, but it's giving you a Dracula that no one's ever really seen on the big screen before because most people were really kind of used to the, the Bela Lugosi sort of look and voice and design. And, you know, to go for this sort of more gothic, romantic, romantic sort of odd design of, of Dracula like with Gary Oldman at least playing at least 12 different looks here was you know not seen at the time and I'm kind of like I'm still kind of blown away by you know how good it looks now I'm just kind of impressed that they like went for it you know like because they they had Gary Oldman and they just were like yes like he's sexy and he's shirtless but he's also like you know a disgusting old man and they like they really went into like every aspect of like his forms like you know he had like his werewolf form and like his creepy demon form and like all the different like versions in between and yeah they weren't afraid to like make him look like shit too which i which i appreciated like he wasn't all just like you know like edward cullen the whole time sure well, this was uh, one of the design choices I don't quite understand, and I think you know which one I'm bringing up here is the uh, the the ass he has on his like on the top of his head. Looks like a baboon's butt. That hair was hideous. Yeah, uh, but it's that's always that's a good opener for him though, where you see his shadow starting to already like make the moves before you even see his face, and the way he prances around, how he just kind of disfigures his body throughout the the course of the film. It's really unnatural and uh, it embraces just the, the creature-like essence that Dracula bodes so well. Um, he's not just this uh, sexual deviant or uh, Vlad the Impaler. He's also yeah, a creature of the night. He's, he's, got, he's there to you know, hunt you down um, if he has the means and the power to. He's, he, he, I don't know, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of range for Gary Oldman. I, I agree. And I also loved, speaking of the outfits, the like the one that he has on in the beginning that kind of looks like the flayed muscle suit. Mm -hmm. I just think that was like so cool. Like it almost looks like like there's a shininess to it. That probably isn't how armor looked at all back then. But it like, I don't know, just the kind of the slickness that made it look just like like exposed muscle. I really liked that that was kind of like the first introduction to him like as you know, just mm -hmm. seeing him like in battle, like with that, with that armor that looked, you know, ridiculous. Um, and Impaling Turks. And <laughs> yeah, that was, that was cool. The, uh, I don't know, like it looked very fake, but I kind of liked that they like leaned into that. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings up one huge departure from the book is that now we've got uh, essentially a backstory for Dracula. He was Vlad the Impaler at one point and boy does this guy get screwed over so hard you know the these letters get sent back to his home saying that he died in battle or you know he was basically at, on you know death's row he was about to just you know bail ass and uh his wife goes ahead and just commits suicide and right as he gets there he just gets pissed off with christianity he throws out the priest and just stabs this crucifix when and blood just gushes all over the screen it's um it's quite fascinating and, and kind of sad that that scene rivaled, I think, the the Shining and just the the ridiculous amount of of, of blood. Uh, yeah, kind of a comedy of errors for him. That's uh, definitely not his best day. Kind of um, kind of embarrassing a little bit. He can't really catch a break throughout this whole thing. And yeah, uh, I, I, one touch I love too was Anthony Hopkins playing the priest as well as I guess even the narrator to a degree. But uh, it almost kind of shows that there's like this family legacy of just. Van Helsing's just always getting in his way. 
Yeah, I mean, that's perfect too for a film that like deals so heavily in this idea of reincarnation, um, which, like I said, I never finished the Dracula book, but I don't remember the Dracula book really having anything to do with reincarnation. Uh, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. This um, takes a lot of leaps and bounds from the book. In terms of uh, the structure of the book, first off, it's um, told in a series of letters, diary entries, um, ship logs, I think even newspaper clippings at points. And it's all from different points of views from each of the characters. So you kind of get this basic story of good versus evil from all the good guys' points of view, where Dracula is you know, more or less just a monster, and he is just hell-bent on going to London and feeding on more people. He doesn't have a tragic backstory. He's not humanized in any sort of way. I'm, I guess I'm kind of glad this film decided to take the approach to, to humanize him and give it more of a, a, a I guess, a, a sad retelling. Yeah, it's interesting that he was kind of um, debatably the protagonist of this movie in some ways, because mm-hmm. I feel like, uh, maybe I'm skipping ahead, but yeah, like Keanu Reeves's um, character uh harper he certainly gets sidelined a bit as the movie goes along and then it's kind of just like dracula and mina who uh yeah it's 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 definitely it's definitely interesting just kind of watching how they become the focus points even after he's just like brutally like massacred an entire boat full of people for instance and uh yeah it's it was a decision that they made for sure but what's your impression of the actual romantic subplot in this? Because that is also nowhere in the book and uh, has always been a, a topic of debate amongst real big fans of Bram Stoker's novel when it comes to this movie's interpretation of, I guess, their love life. Um, well, Win- Winona Ryder and Gary Oldman are both just so attractive that I can't, like, not... Like, I can't dislike it, for sure. But it's... And I think it makes the movie kind of its own thing and its own like uh, organism almost. So I appreciate that they kind of went for it and had that element because it definitely sets the tone and makes it different. Um, but yeah, the love story is kind of ridiculous. Um, and it's, you know, she kind of cheats on John for him, which not great. And then he obviously kills a bunch of people. So also not great. So it's not exactly like healthy relationship goals. I, I can't, I can't in good conscience support it. It's a little seductive how it all comes about. It's it's merely just because Mina looks exactly like his wife. I mean, what are the odds? I remember at one point Jonathan Harker asks, you know, uh, Dracula, you know, wh- why do you want these four specific locations in London? Is there money to be had there? Is there some financial growth you can you can build in these uh, in these locations? He he doesn't even answer his question. He looks at this photo of Mina and then Mealy just gets attracted to his fiance and. <laughs> things kind of just set off from there. Odd too that we don't see Jonathan Harker for at least another hour. Like he pops in, I want to say at least around the hour and 20 minute mark of the movie. And I, at that point I'd forgotten that he was even in it. Yeah. He didn't really, he was kind of the damsel in distress of it. I, I like the scenes with the brides. Um, and I'd heard that one of the, the actresses who played one of the brides, she, was actually uh, Romanian, I think. So she spoke Romanian and she like kind of coached the others on how to speak it correctly, which is neat that they actually like got someone who was um, fluent and like from that uh, from that region. But um, yeah, he, he mostly just existed to show how cool and seductive the vampire brides were and then to be helpless for a while. And then, yeah, he, it wasn't a great movie for, for him, to be honest. He, he, he didn't do as, as he does in some adaptations. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, to go to your first point there with uh, one of the brides. Um, that seems like a total like Coppola decision because he loves trying to be as authentic as he possibly can. I know when he was filming um, Apocalypse Now, sorry, um, when he was filming that, he didn't even have the script on hand the whole set. He was, only had the book Heart of Darkness that he was working off of. He didn't even know if the film was going off on, on or off script. Yeah, and it shows. And I think he he definitely exudes that authenticity here too, which goes a lot into the the actual filmmaking. It's it's really old school looking here. It's it's got a, a theatrical, very obvious on set sort of quality. They use a lot of miniatures, a lot of practical effects. Um, no computer technology at all to be seen here, apparently. I think they were pushing to have some computer technology 
or some CGI like bits here and there, but um, Francis Ford Coppola, he would not budge. He actually fired his effects team and then brought on his son, Roman Coppola, to handle the effects side of things so that things were running the way he wanted it to be seen. And I'm not going to say, I'm not one of those guys that says, uh, you know, they don't make they don't make them like they used to or they don't make movies like as good as they did back then. But um, because obviously they do, it's just it depends on how you reach your audience. And, uh, you know, if you it's all on it's all about outreach, honestly, um, there's weird movies out there that you would never know existed. I respect what they did for sure, though. It's it, it's definitely I think if they'd add, added CGI, especially for the time when it was made. I don't think it would have held up as well. Like watching it now from, you know, 2020, uh, like the effects are kind of campy and some of them show, but I think that adds to it in some ways, like adds a charm. Like the shadow thing you mentioned earlier with the, when Dracula is moving and then his shadow kind of moves with him and then becomes like disengaged. Like they had another guy like do that and be the shadow and so it's not perfect like it would be if you use like cgi but that like kind of helps to make it look like how unsettling it is like disjointed almost so i think the effects like even when they're imperfect i think kind of to to some of the appeal for me yeah it definitely gives it a lot more of an unnatural quality it's weird we almost could have gotten like a i guess a van helsing which is very cgi heavy if you if you use that as an example the the steven summer film yeah that movie you know that that sh- that shot at shot. It was it was certainly a movie that they made with with people, actual actors that they got to do that. So uh, yeah, kudos to them. Yeah, they got an actual Hugh Jackman to play our our loving uh, Van Helsing. Yeah. Well, speaking of Dracula's though, that Dracula was I don't know who who the actor was, but he really followed in the Gary Oldman school of just hamming it up as much as possible. I respect the the dedication to form. Yeah, I I'm glad you remember that Dracula because I don't at all. <laughs> oh, he was the best part. I love that Dracula. What do you make of some of the other uh, members of the cast here? We have Carrie Elwes as Arthur, Richard E. Grant as Jack Seward, and Billy Campbell, my boy Billy Campbell as Quincy Morris. He was uh, he was the Rocketeer. If you ever if you ever saw that movie. No, I don't think I'm familiar. The only one I'm familiar with is, uh, Carrie because of princess bride yeah um, and he was weird i feel like his arthur always struck me as like I, I i did not trust him he looked like he was i i think the one scene in particular i'm thinking of is when lucy is like thrashing around and they're like she's like calling out to him and like trying to kiss people and he just looks like he has this expression on his face that looks like weirdly like low-key turned on but like in like a really like creepy kind of way like someone about to flash you in like a crowded bus like not a savory kind of guy at all i definitely got a a creepy vibe from him but he also felt i don't know borderline useless compared to the other two gentlemen in terms of uh jack jack seward at least he he's a you know certified medical physician he's he's you know working hard to make sure everybody's good and healthy and then you got Quincy, who is like this really, I don't know, badass rogue Texas gunslinger type. They just... Lucy should have gone for one of them instead. Yeah, they they were they were the better choices. Like Jack was, yeah. I don't know, you know, he was he was an interesting actor for sure. I think I liked him better as an actor. And Quincy, you know, he seemed like a solid guy. I feel like I don't know anything about him, despite the fact that he likes like big knives and he's he's American. Those yeah. are more personality traits than I think Arthur had. Yeah, and then we had Sadie Frost as Lucy, and then Tom Waits as Renfield, which is probably the most bizarre casting choice, but kind of worked in his favor. Um, the scenes that he's in, he's chewing a lot of scenery, but he's having a, a fun time in this role. Oh, he was great. Those those bug scenes, though, they I do you know what they actually like substituted the bugs with? Like, I hope to God he wasn't actually eating bugs, but I don't know. I wouldn't put it past probably fake bugs but unless tom waits is just a, a, a weirdo and um asked for real bugs then <laughs> i wouldn't put it past him fair enough i'd respect it also i i do like this uh interpretation of van helsing that anthony hopkins sort of puts on he gives it kind of like a wacky curiosity i i, I is how i would describe his uh 
his interest in uh, you know, pursuing Dracula and killing him for good to the point to where he's just kind of like teasing his peers who really don't know what's going on. He's really the only one kind of spoon feeding all the information of uh, Dracula's uh, lore and uh, uh, what what he what he's capable of doing to them. And, oh, he's hilarious too. He's, yeah, <laughs> he had some really funny lines. Uh, the delivery was solid. Um, he he's kind of he seemed he struck me as a kind of terrible person in some ways, like oh, the sure. character. But you know, he was so fun in the role, and it felt like the actor was uh, really enjoying himself. I don't know, maybe he was having the worst time of his life. But to me, it seemed like there was kind of a like an almost carefree spirit that that came through. And then the scene after Lucy dies, and he's talking with. Uh, Mina and, and 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 Jonathan and they're asking if Lucy suffered and he said well yeah like she you know we uh, we put a stake through her heart and then we cut off her head uh, and then he's cutting into the the meat as he's doing it of his mm -hmm. meal so that that was that was a that was a fun scene yeah the whole uh, the whole sequence with uh, Lucy even coming down those steps with that child they, the movie doesn't really hint at this enough but. Uh, when Lucy was kind of on the loose as a vampire, she was basically sucking the blood of, or or killing, I guess, or slaying a bunch of children. And that's why she comes down the step with, with that one little girl. There's like little things like that where uh, if you've never read the book, there are little things the film kind of glosses over or inserts that could look confusing. Like even Dracula having hairy palms at the beginning or climbing on the side of his tower. Um, all are book accurate, but that's uh, it can certainly look odd. Uh, from a design standpoint and from a story standpoint. Yeah, no, I, I like how it's interesting how willing they were to diverge from the book in so many ways, but how they kept so many like small elements that I feel like a lot of adaptations don't include. Like the Harry Palms thing, I don't think I've seen any other Dracula movies where he has Harry Palms, like at all. So it is like a very detail oriented and like a dedication to the book, even when they just kind of say like, fuck the book we're just going to do our own thing i guess are there any negative things about the film that you don't think hold up or uh kind of irk you or just just don't work i guess i feel like i can excuse most of the flaws because i have such a good time when i watch it that even the flaws are like entertainingly bad uh, sure but i will say keanu reeves his performance is mixed and that is i can't get past how bad his accent is like I, I hate it so much. Every time he tries to do that British accent, I, I lose my mind a little bit. That's the one thing that really, really bugs me. Yeah, that's that's definitely the easy one to go for, and it's it's definitely not a good accent. I, I wouldn't say it's one of the worst performances of all time, but, I mean, it definitely does hold the film back quite a bit. I would even say Winona Ryder is not quite as strong either with her accent. She, she and him both, it, it's kind of odd casting choices um, for Coppola in that um, the only reason I could see them in there is that maybe they they were just younger actors at the time that could get more teenagers to see the film because so I think before this uh, Winona Ryder did Edward Scissorhands and then Keanu Reeves had done Bill and Ted 2 and My Own Private Idaho so you know these were young up and coming stars I, I guess they needed that one big break and Coppola just ran into them I guess I, I think Coppola actually wanted Winona Ryder to be in Godfather Part 3, but she turned it down at the time. Yeah, I liked Winona Ryder a lot, actually. I thought she did a good job. Like you said, her accent was, was not amazing. Um, but I thought she generally delivered like a solid performance. I liked her stuff with... Um, I think she sold the romantic bits with, with Gary Oldman pretty well. Um, but yeah, Keanu Reeves, I, I have a hard time excusing any aspect of his performance it is interesting watching him like now post like john wick fame just kind of going back and, and looking at him in that role it's, it's different well now he's just a a total meme in today's culture i mean i don't even know if i could take keanu reeves seriously anymore he's going to be a a tumbleweed in the new spongebob film apparently oh is he yeah you know sure why not yeah i, I would say winona Ryder was uh, oh, she definitely fit in this film um uh, and she made it work to the best of her ability. I will say, I mean, as be it, she's got quite a messed up relationship with Dracula to the point of how she decides to just brutally end his life. 
at the end of the book, Dracula just turns to dust and that's it. No, we got to go hardcore. We got to like, we got to stab that thing right in the heart and then just chop off its head. And I would just, I would have just let Dracula just, just die peacefully in his sleep. That's all he ever needed. <laughs> yeah, she, she wanted to, well, she wanted to make sure that it really stuck. Um, she wanted to really forcefully relieve him of his, his misery the, the hard way. Um, yeah, I think the end scene was, was a little overdone. Uh, but, you know, it's certainly, it certainly worked with the, the rest of the over the top style of the movie because his death was very over the top. Like it wasn't like you said, just a simple matter. Like she was, she really went for it. Hey, I mean, they were, they were licking each other's blood three scenes ago. So anything, anything can, can happen, I guess. I liked how she went from like, you know, you killed my best friend in the world. Like how dare you, you monster to being like, I'm just, I'm totally into this. Please make me a vampire too. I will be a willing bride. It was a very sharp turnaround. I feel like most people would need like, you know, like a couple of days at least to kind of reconcile those feelings. But for her, no, like she was very, uh, you know, I guess she's she's a ride or die chick. Is, isn't it tragic though that the curse is now lifted and she can no longer be a vampire? So I was kind of left there wondering what she was going to do next. Either if, if she was just going to, commit suicide or end up back with Jonathan Harker. Yeah. How awkward do you think that conversation was? Like on the way back? Yeah, they're they're just like, like sitting they had in to there. have a conversation, right? Like, huh, well, that was uh that was a thing that happened. Um do you want to try this again? I know. I I I would I wouldn't want to see a whole movie just on that because it wasn't like the books where Mina was forced to be a vampire and she was trying to work with you know, her husband and the rest of the team to kind of stop Dracula. Uh, she she really just decided on her own initiative then she that she was in love with Dracula and she wanted to, to be one of his minions forever. So it's, you know, it, I wonder if it was difficult for Jonathan to, to look at her afterwards, considering he'd been like held hostage by Dracula's brides for a very long time. It would have uh, ended with Keanu Reeves uh seeing her come out from the castle and him just going, whoa. <laughs> I heard that, you know, yes. I think that would have been maybe like the po perfect post credit scene. I would have loved that. <laughs> just the kind of uh, phone booth drops from the sky. Well, hopefully Coppola, um, there, maybe there's an interview somewhere where he's probably expressed a sort of epilogue to this whole story. Uh, yeah, uh, a good nail in the coffin, um, pun intended, to end it strong and give these characters their dues yeah maybe they all get reincarnated like a third time yeah or something perhaps <laughs> like dracula just like wakes up on a spaceship mina's some kind of i don't know astronaut uh that would be hilarious i would definitely watch that one minor thing one minor gripe i have with this film too is some of the editing choices um well i do get a very good grand sense of I guess this world, the way it's sometimes edited, it, it will jump around in spots where I I would never have cut if I was editing it. I guess maybe it felt like there was sometimes a missing scene or two in between a few parts. Uh, for instance, there's a scene where Anthony Hopkins makes a ring of fire around him and Mina, and he starts just belligerently shouting at the, the three brides, and then it just jump cuts to him walking into a cave and cutting off their heads. To, yeah, I, the missing... It definitely doesn't, you know, really sweat too much about the connective tissue between scenes. It's like a, a budget thing, or maybe it's like a artistic choice. But I agree, that's definitely a flaw of the movie, uh, for sure. But for the most part, it does keep you pretty much in line with the the narrative style of the book, because there are many times the characters will they'll be reciting their letters or their diary entries, and that kind of keeps you it keeps keeps the ball going and gives you enough exposition as it goes along that Van Helsing wouldn't otherwise provide. Yeah, they tried to do that a little in the, the movie because they did have some like diary entry scenes and like that narration. Did you did you feel like that was similar to the book? Like did that kind of um, did that kind of like make you recollect the book a little in those ways or was it just like too yeah. weird or too different? In terms of how you would translate the book because it's really it's basically a found footage movie but in book form um that's probably the best you could probably do unless you wanted to make a documentary about dracula but 
Uh, maybe someone's done that. I don't know. But uh, I thought it was—I thought that was actually a pretty pinpoint, accurate way of portraying how Bram Stoker wrote it. I would say the closest it ever feels to the book is actually the first ten or fifteen minutes with Jonathan Harker going up to the castle, right from the creepy figure driving the stagecoach to the the town locals giving him the cross, saying, "You know, you should probably turn back. This is not a good idea." Uh, to the wolves he sees in the distance, the weird glow, all of that was so pure and like just like fed off the pages perfectly. I don't think I've seen any other adaptation do that so well. Who was the driver of the, the stagecoach? Was that supposed to be Dracula? He had the same creepy arm extendy thing, but I never really, it seemed more lizard-like. People predict the whole trip the second he arrives, it's all Dracula one, like playing all of these characters just to get a, kind of get a sense of Harker before he lets him into his castle. Did he play the old lady too? Or the, the lady who uh, told him like, don't, don't go there. I hope so. Possibly. That's secretly Dracula, like yeah. shapeshifted. Which is another thing. If he can shapeshift to look the way he does when he's in London, I, I assume he's able to harness enough power while he's in Transylvania. I don't know why he decides to look like a weird old man when he can just look young and handsome. Maybe it's like, a, you know, like when I'm just at home by myself and I just wear like shitty PJs. You know, like, I'm not trying to impress anyone. Like, I don't think he was really, like, too worried about, like, impressing Jonathan. So, you know, he's chilling, like, in his castle by himself. This is the equivalent of just being, like, taking the makeup off, just putting on my ratty old, like, PJ pants. Yeah. Versus, you know, when he's in London, he's he's trying to impress high society a little bit more. He wants to, like, look his best. That's 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 my headcanon for 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 that. He wants to, you know, make sure that Jonathan knows that there's no mass between them. Sure, sure. So it's kind of sad where uh, Coppola's career has, I guess, kind of taken a little bit of a nosedive since the release of this film. Even though this film was received very well, he followed it up three or four years later with the film Jack, where Robin Williams plays, uh, a, a, I guess, a ten-year-old kid in a forty-year-old man's body. Have you heard of this? I have not. That sounds really weird. How was Fucking terrible. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. I don't know much about his films in general. Um, I haven't even seen Apocalypse Now, so I'm not the biggest uh, follower of, of Francis Ford Coppola. He's, uh... I feel like I've seen more of his daughter's films. Yeah, it's funny. His daughter is the one who's probably kind of dancing circles around him right now with her films i think she's got a new one coming out uh later this year or was going to have one i don't know i guess corona will dictate that yeah in fact i think i wasn't sofia coppola supposed to adapt the new little mermaid at one point i'm not sure i feel like she I don't know, maybe i i think there was a story where she was going to but then ran into creative differences with disney as you do and probably wanted to tell more darker version that's related to the fable and not the disney adaptation we all know yeah i've definitely heard the original version it's 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 a bit different like doesn't she like it's constantly painful for her to walk with her legs and then she you know the prince leaves her and she turns into sea foam or something at the end that's that sounds like a a great horror movie in the making potentially oh yeah and then I think, yeah, Coppola, he, well, he's a very eclectic director and writer. He's, I, I'm more familiar with his work from the 70s. I think the 80s, most of that decade, he was doing stuff, but he was also um, paying back a lot of loans. So it was kind of a weird period for him. And then he kind of reignited with, with Dracula. I guess recently, the last film he's done was a, a weird film called Twixt. It has Elle Fanning and Val Kilmer in it. It's like a weird exorcism ghost story is it, it wasn't very good from what i remember it's like francis ford coppola just learned what a green screen was for the first time i haven't seen val kilmer in anything for a really long time honestly i kind of didn't know that he was still doing stuff to be honest he'll pop up in the most random assortment of films he was in that movie the snowman uh, with michael fassbender oh for, yeah for with like the the it was like I never saw it, but the trailers would look like a demon or like a serial killer or something. And it, it's one of the most poorly edited films I've ever seen in recent years. It's kind of funny though. Seems like it's worth a watch if, if nothing else. I don't know, just like really weird 
uh, oddball decisions on the director, because I think it's the same guy who did the Let Me In remake. Oh, God, we're tying it back to vampires so well. Yeah. How... So I haven't seen as many movies as you, and I'm not as much a cinema buff as you. How would you maybe say that, like, vampire movies and, like, the vampire genre was... Because obviously this film was influenced by Dracula the book, but, like, how were maybe other films influenced by this movie, like, if at all? Just given the reputation of this film, I would say since then we've seen a lot more romantic uh, Dracula or vampire adaptations in general. I think the the rise of Twilight certainly uh, wedged a new uh, realm of the, the vampire mythos in that they can still be scared of the light, they still need to be invited in, but they also can be super sexy, overly sexy. Um, maybe that's all they want to just do. But then you'll see other adaptations like, yeah, Let the Right One In, which is a more authentic tale of, a, of your prototypical vampire, but from a a much much darker background. I think people are really experimenting nowadays with the what the general preconception is of the vampire. I think people can even break some rules. Like I would love to see a vampire that loves to eat, I don't know, garlic, parmesan, french bread, but that's just me. Like maybe I uh, I'm thinking of maybe Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Like I feel like he was kind of broke a lot of vampire rules. I think one episode he like I I think he put like some kind of cereal in his like blood because he liked the the texture of it better or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely more interesting I see to see vampires who kind of like break from those because I saw the Dracula movie that was like 2014 or 2016 with Luke Evans. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember what it was. I think Dracula Untold. Uh, yes. It was really bad and. It, it really copied this movie a little because, you know, it had the Dracula is Vlad the Impaler and his love interest is a woman who is reincarnated to become Mina, like eventually at the end of the movie, spoilers. Um, and it was just really boring. Like it just felt like stuff that, you know, we'd already seen, like already already seen it, like already been done. But it's it's definitely much more interesting to, to have vampires that kind of tread their own their own paths for sure i think there's yeah there's just so much you can do with the mythos and even the dracula character himself because i mean he's a character who's in the public domain and he uh, there's got to be at least there's gonna be a thousands upon thousands of adaptations of dracula where he you know he fights the frankenstein monster or he meets billy the kid at one point or at one point he was black you know it's just everybody has their their take on the character yeah, the the Blackula movies. Yeah, the Blackula. Th there's I thought a... that was some like weird fever dream I had. That, that weren't there like a series too, like a series of films. I I, I know of the first one, but I I uh, don't know if there were any other Blackula films, to my knowledge. That's that's great though. No, I I respect it. I guess as we kind of come to a close here, would you recommend uh, Dracula to those who have not seen it? Um, whether they have read the book or not, or even very familiar or care about the character, would you still recommend the movie? Or would it just, would, is it an acquired taste? I, I think you kind of, you're going to like it or you're going to dislike it. Uh, but it's worth a watch. Like, it's entertaining for sure. Even if you think it's a hot mess, which I'm not going to debate. Like, yes, like it kind of is a hot mess in many ways. Um, I like it for purely subjective reasons for the most part. Although objectively, it is a beautiful film so you know even if you dislike it i think there's something to appreciate and that it will be at worst like a beautiful disaster so yeah i would i would still still recommend it but i would never make promises that someone would enjoy it yeah i would still recommend it to people too who um just want to see something a little bit more unconventional and uh gothic and uh even dreamlike in its approach and I like it from a, just from a filmmaking standpoint, how old school Francis Ford Coppola was adamant about taking this, this venture of the, the character. I, I would be hard pressed to know a person who didn't at least think it was at least a, a, you know, a beautiful looking film because it is gorgeous to, to look at. Every scene feels like a painting. I would, I would highly recommend it to, to people out there who haven't seen it yet. Or if you have seen it and you weren't too fond of it the first time, maybe rewatch it again and maybe you might find something you know, you never knew you liked. Yeah, like lower your expectations first a little bit. Be realistic with this film. If you're realistic with this film, it, it can't disappoint you. Yeah, 
like you said, it, yeah, it is a, a little bit of a hot mess, but it's a, it's a beautiful one. There's a sinister, darker side to him. I find irresistible. I have never met any man with such a passion for life. He is unlike any man. What are you? Vampires do exist. This one we fight, this one we face. It can take on many forms. He is both young and old. Is there anything you would like to plug for the listeners? I uh, no, I would I would request that people stop buying out all, all the pasta and pasta sauce and frozen foods at the grocery store. It's been really difficult the last few times I've I've been there. Um, but not nothing nothing else. Just you know, be be gentle with how much food you take. I need food too. Yeah, I, I fullheartedly agree. People are hoarding like, like it's this is like the end of the world. <laughs> someone bought like, I saw the last time I was at Safeway, someone filled up half of their cart with frozen meat, which I kind of get, or like meat, cause like you can freeze it, and then the other half was milk, which is definitely gonna go bad. Like that's not that's a perishable. Uh, people are being pretty crazy. Yeah, the things that are trending and the things people pick as their uh survival is now being tested is uh is very odd it's 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 this is going to be a fun tale in the history books about just the human condition and the odd irrational decisions we make as human beings yep we'll all be forced to to turn into to introverts so we'll all be so good by the end we'll just have perfected our hermit skills we'll come out with like a whole philosophy book to each per person yeah i would say to, to people out there you know use this time well if you're feeling well to just uh to definitely read uh exercise meditate learn a new skill um don't just binge watch shows on netflix even though that's fun to do too but you know do, be, do something productive i guess clean your room you can watch dracula many many times yeah you can also listen to this podcast that compare would, that would... it compare and contrast all right, you can follow me over at facebook.com at Film Chow Productions. You can also follow me on Twitter at Jeremoby. And you can also follow me on Letterboxd and keep up with uh, the films I've been watching at Jeremoby as well. All right, thank you so much for doing this, Ariella. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. <laughs>